Hi, I'm Kathy English, curator of Revelstoke Museum and Archives. Today we're talking about the Big Bend Highway, which was completed on June 29, 1940. The Big Bend is defined as the area between Revelstoke and Golden, north of our communities, the, uh, following the, the bend of the Columbia River. The Columbia River starts in uh, near Canal Flat, south of Invermere, and travels north past Golden to about, for about 100 miles, takes the Big Bend, and then comes down past Revelstoke and continues on its way to the Pacific Ocean. The Big Bend was significant for the early Indigenous people in this area, particularly the Sinaiaks and the Sequepmec, who used the area for transportation and uh, for hunting and gathering. It was significant in terms of the early uh, exploration in this area, particularly David Thompson, who had mapped the entire Columbia River by 1811. It was also significant uh, for uh, the fur trade, became a fur trade route for several decades in the early 1800s. And uh, in eight, the 1860s, there was a gold rush north of Revelstoke, the Big Bend Gold Rush, that uh, saw several million dollars of gold taken out in a very short period of time. When Revelstoke was established as a community in the 1880s, the Big Bend was still really uh, mining territory, and there was a lot of activity taking part in that area in terms of, of mining. And uh, the miners were asking for trails to be built. The provincial government was building some trails. By 1891, they'd finished a rough trail to Eight Mile Falls, uh, also known as Silvertip Falls. And uh, some of the mining packers from this area were also building their own trails, particularly George Laform, who was a mining, mining packer into the Big Bend for many years. But by 1928, the road still only reached Carnes Creek, just 26 miles north of Revelstoke. At that time, by 1928, there was a decision made between the federal and provincial governments agreeing to joint completion of the highway between Golden and Revelstoke. It was seen as quite urgent by that time. A lot of roads were being built in the, the interior of BC and Alberta, and uh, people could easily travel from Revelstoke west as far as Vancouver, but there was no route east. So people who were tra got who did get as far as Revelstoke by car would have to have their cars shipped by rail over to Golden. So it presented a significant barrier to transportation in this area. And there was a lot of political will to get the road built. But of course, there was a discussion about the route. Uh, there were some people who felt that uh, there shouldn't be any route in this area at all, that they should be just looking at a northern route through uh, Jasper and the Yellowhead Pass. But uh, certainly from this area, people were wanting to see a route between Revelstoke and Golden. So they looked at the two possible routes following the bend of the Columbia River or building it at, through the site of the, uh, the railway route through Rogers Pass in the Selkirk Mountains. That was uh, certainly the preferred route of the people from Revelstoke and from Golden, but it was seen as uh, too difficult in terms of engineering and mitigation of the avalanche risk. So the Big Bend route was uh, chosen, and the agreement between the federal and the provincial government was that Revelstoke, or the BC would be in charge of the section between Revelstoke and Boat encampment at the top of the bend, and the Dominion government would be responsible for the eastern section to Golden. The route was 190 miles long. Uh, construction finally began in 1929, but it wasn't completed until the spring of 1940. So one of the, the factors in that was, of course, what happened in the fall of 1929 was the Great Depression. And that certainly made it difficult 
to continue the the, the work that the uh, the construction work in uh, during that time. By March of 1930, there was work being uh, carried out. A bridge had been built over Holditch Creek, and uh, by March of 1930, with a crew of 100 of 18 men, the bridge was 180 feet long. In uh, April of 1930, Honorable N. S. Lougheed, who was the Provincial Minister of Public Works, spoke of the importance of the Big Bend Highway in the legislature. At that time, uh, only 40 miles was completed and 150 miles remaining, so still a lot of work to be done. But uh, he, uh, at that time, they were expecting that the highway would be built between two to three years. We know that didn't happen. But he also mentioned the importance of the highway in creating access to the great timber and mineral resources of the region. Uh, by May of uh, 1930, it was reported that uh, 250 men were to be employed by the middle of June, and 150,000 was to be spent on road building that year. Uh, they, there were camps uh, operating in the Big Bend for the, uh, the work crews, and uh, at that time, all but two of the men on the crew were permanent residents of Revelstoke. There really was a strong commitment to hiring locally. Uh, by July of 1930, there were 10 work camps between Carnes Creek and Goldstream. But by the middle of November of 1930, the road had advanced only up to 45 miles just south of Downey Creek. They'd only completed 15 miles of work that year. But by December of 1930, the first automobile had reached Downey. In 1931, William Fleming was appointed as a general foreman. He was a well-known Revelstoke person. And they had a bridge at Downey put in by April of 1931. It was a Howe Trust bridge. Unemployed men from across the country were coming to Revelstoke looking for work, uh, both on the, the CPR and on the Big Bend Highway. But at that time, they were still only hiring locals for road construction. But uh, later that year, a relief camp work camps were being created, and the provincial government was establishing work camps in the area. Uh, by July of 1931, there were 160 men working on the road, and it was announced that the Big Bend Highway was uh, officially noted as a link in the Trans-Canada Highway. The, at, in 1931, uh, workers were being paid $2 a day for general labor, plus 80 cents per day to dependent families. And the rates uh, went up to over $5 for foremen and skilled trades. But when the relief camps were in effect, the, the rates went down and it made it very difficult for people with families to work under the relief rates. Because it really didn't support a family and uh, they weren't, at that point, they weren't giving any uh, additional pay for uh, dependent families. By mid-October of 1931, there were close to 1,000 men working on the road, 600 of them on the provincial side. But in uh, November, the road work was shut down throughout the province because the Dominion government curtailed the appropriation for unemployment relief in BC. The locals came down from the camps, but the non-locals remained there. They had nowhere else to go. The newspaper said, it is understood that the shutting down of the work is only temporary and that it will result in the weeding out of men who are not altogether destitute, suggesting that some of the men registering might have private means, uh, even if they were also unemployed. Uh, but there was a lot of people in pretty desperate straits during the, the, during the Depression. But by mid-December, it was announced that relief work would continue, but on a reduced scale, and the Big Bend was approved for work relief camps. In 1932, Ottawa announced uh, the approval of $180,000 for the Big Bend Road, but the work didn't actually start until mid-June when the camps were reopened. Uh, it was noted in the paper that once the highway was opened, it would shorten the uh, travel time from Vancouver to Calgary uh, down to two and a half days. Uh, 
In, uh, later in 1932, the uh, Government of Canada established a Federal Department of uh, Militia and Defense Relief Camps. And uh, they had those camps in place on the Big Bend by September of 1932. And the, so the, a lot of the construction at that time was being done by the relief workers, other than the skilled tradesmen. The men who were working in these Department of uh, Defense relief camps were provided with three meals a day, work clothes and medical care, but only 20 cents a day in pay. And there were no benefits for men with, with families. So really it was only uh, uh, applicable for single men. The men were working 44 hour weeks. Uh, there was a lot of criticism that the federal government had established the camps instead of creating a reasonable program of work and wages. By the time that all of the uh, federal camps across Canada were closed in June of 1936, they'd been home for 170,248 men. The local newspaper reporter went to, uh, to visit some of the camps in September of uh, 1933 and uh, gave this report. The reporter said, in fact, the camp facilities provided by the Department of Militia and Defense, under which branch the road work is now being carried out, are improved over those in vogue under the former administration of relief in that area. And he mentioned that there were camps at 10 mile, 12 mile, and 15 mile, with about 130 men in total. The, another camp was to be opened at 21 mile, uh, the reporter said, an inspection of the various camps shows that the men are being well, care for, well cared for, and although they are suffering with the whole country through lack of regular employment at fair wages, nevertheless they appear to be fairly well satisfied. They have made themselves comfortable through various devices. Hot and cold shower baths have been installed. Ventilation in camps is much better than formerly obtained. Hospital and first aid camps are well equipped with frequent medical inspection. All cabins are scrubbed out three times weekly and disinfected. Sleeping accommodation has been reduced in all cabins so that healthier conditions might prevail. No semblance of military discipline is in evidence on the work. On the other hand, freedom of action and individual initiative is encouraged. All men on going into camp are furnished ample bedding supplies, outer and inner garments, gloves, caps, boots, socks, mirror, safety razors, and other minor incidentals. In addition, regular and sufficient tobacco rations are served out, and other items were avail made available through coupons at the company store. The reporter went on to say that the men were in need of books and games for off-hours entertainment. Uh, by uh, June of uh, 1936, the uh, Minister of the Interior, Honorable T.A. Creer, announced that the completion of the final 79 miles of the Big Bend Highway would cost about $2 million. Uh, so construction continued. By July 1938, it was noted that there was still just 14 miles more to go. The uh, reporter said, working from both the eastern and the Western or Revelstoke end, about 500 men under the Dominion government engineers are so close to completion of this historic route that the noise of each other's blasting operations are easily heard by either party. And a Vancouver journalist wrote, like many Vancouver people, I have entertained the notion that this road was a thing of high mountain passes or perilous grades and curves of primitive road work that might at some distant date be a passable road for auto travel. Instead, I found a fine stretch of road that follows the water grade of the majestic Columbia River, rising approximately 1,000 feet in the 193 miles from Revelstoke to Golden, and without a hazard on it, save for dust. And uh, he mentioned that he uh, made it uh, 66 miles on the western leg which was farther than any previous private car. The construction was finally completed 
due to the needs of the military once World War II began, uh, there was a real need for uh, military vehicles to be able to pass over, uh, pass through this region. So they, they finally, by 1940, uh, completed the last uh, sections of the highway. And um, in uh, June of 1940, it was mentioned that the oiling of the highway had begun and 40 tanks, tank cars of oil were needed to complete the work. Um, a sad incident happened when a, uh, one of the, the drivers uh, careened off the road and struck a huge rock and his truck caught fire and unfortunately the man died at the scene. The Revelstoke Review printed a Big Bend edition for the opening in June uh, 29th. It was a, a four-section edition, had a lot of the history of the region in it. But uh, one of the sections in there uh, said that uh, Mile 80 on the West Leg was the scene of the last construction camp. Here, beside a roaring creek of purest mountain water, fresh from some hidden glacier, was hollowed out space for canvas-topped bunkhouses and that essential of all camps, the cookhouse. In charge was one of the best powder men ever to work in a country where powder men are essential and their skill highly valued. Highball Johnson is a genial native of Sweden with a background of many years in the Big Bend. Johnson worked the men under an engineer resident in Revelstoke, while Cook Cachado, with a record of six summers on the Bend, fed the hungry crews the fine varied menus common to all good lumber or construction camps. So, uh, the, the opening ceremony was on June 29, 1940 at Bowdoin Camp and Bridge. It was a steel truss bridge with a curved upper cord and a clear span of 270 feet and a, an available width of 20 feet. At the ceremony was Premier Patello, and Honorable T.A. Creer, Dominion Minister of Mines and Natural Resources. And uh, Premier Patello cut the ribbon and pronounced, no tape, red or otherwise, shall hinder the progress of British Columbia. Uh, you could consider that a bit of an ironic statement considering that it took about 12 years for the highway to be built. Uh, also on the platform was Catherine Fraser, who was noted as one of the, the first uh, pioneer women to live in Revelstoke, and uh, she was honored by Walter Hardman, the mayor of Revelstoke. The provincial police were there doing traffic control. Uh, the, altogether, there were about 20 speakers. A band was there uh, playing music, and uh, the CBC radio was there. Uh, filming or uh, recording the ceremony. A free lunch was served with sandwiches, donuts and pie. 150 autos traveled over the bridge after the ceremony, many continuing on to Golden and uh, Eastern parts. One of the uh, sort of iconic pieces that was on the Big Bend Highway for many years at Boat Encampment was uh, the little symbol known as Wooden Head. It was carved by Peter Fioco, who was working on one of the construction camps. And he saw this uh, tree stump that to him looked like a head. So he decided to finish carving it, add some features to it, add a little top or boater style hat. And the stump was removed and placed right alongside the road at uh, Bowdoin Encampment with a sign uh, saying, don't be wooden headed, drive slowly and enjoy the scenery. So it was uh, one of the, it was the, the first uh, traffic safety message on the Big Bend Highway. The uh, entire highway was turned over to the uh, province for maintenance. The uh, highway could only remain open during the, the summer months. They weren't able to keep it open in the winter uh, they weren't able to do, uh, do any uh, uh, enough plowing to be able to keep it open. So uh, even though it was finally created a link between Revelstoke and Golden, it was still limited because of the, the lack of, of winter travel. 
it was usually April, sometimes even May, before the road could be opened uh, each year. Uh, the um, highway was, uh, it didn't have the, the high passes, certainly the, the Rogers Pass has, but it was uh, a, known as a dangerous highway. There was a lot of switchbacks. It was quite narrow. And of course, as it wasn't paved, it was always quite dusty as well. The uh, Big Bend Highway w remained the only uh, auto link between Revelstoke and Golden until the summer of 1962, when the Rogers Pass Highway section of the Trans-Canada Highway was finally completed. Uh, and the Big Bend Highway was closed by 1972 prior to the creation of the Mica Dam Reservoir.